Welcome to another episode of Reason for Truth. I'm your host, Stephen Garofalo, and with the world seems like it's kind of burning up inferno. But hey, you know, listen, our hope is in Jesus. It's not in this world. Easy to say. And uh, with all the teeth of violence raging, listen, we've got issues. The big question we want to answer this week, everyone's like, it's the end of the times. It's the Armageddon. I don't know about that. You could tune in last week for the 666 uh, episode. We're going to be talking a little bit more about end times here because that seems to be what's on everybody's mind. And uh, the big question is, uh, people are asking me, are is really, are Christians going to go through the tribulation? And we want to talk about that. Are we going to suffer? Or are we going to be get off the hook? Well, that's what we want to talk about today. You know, will Christians go through tribulation and Armageddon? Listen, welcome to Reads for Truth. I'm your host, Stephen Garofalo. I appreciate you tuning in with uh, for us today for another episode with all the craziness going on in society, uh, really in culture, with defunding police and violence and looting. Uh, never say anything like it. Never thought I'd say anything like it. It's uh, an election year. Uh, I never thought I'd see this much deprivation going on in a culture, uh, not about uh, really, um, I don't know, the issue that started it, but I think it's uh, it's uh, it's a political year. I'll leave it at that. Uh, bottom line is, a lot of people are asking me, hey, uh, at the end of the day, are is Jesus coming back? You know, are we going to suffer along with uh, Christians in in through the tribulation period? What is the tribulation period? And so we're going to answer some of those questions today. With will Christians go through the tribulation Armageddon? Will we suffer with Antifa and the violence ravaging the nations? Many people are reacting with either apathy or hope and peace. The one question that most everyone has been asking is, will the church, that is the authentic believers in Jesus Christ, be taken up into heaven by Jesus before, during, or after the tribulation period, the Armageddon? My conclusion is that despite what you think, the most important thing that you can do is be ready. And really, it's not a question of if, but when Jesus Christ will return back to judge the earth. By choosing and following Jesus Christ now, you can ensure you're going to have eternal life, heaven, and be with him for eternity. Hello, welcome to Reason for Truth, where the truth comes first, the reasons comes last. But listen, we're constantly and always learning. If you're not learning, remember, you're not teaching. So today we are talking about do Christians go through the tribulation period and are they going to suffer through Armageddon? And you're, I think you're going to like today's episode. If you do, please like, subscribe, and share. And if you're on YouTube watching this, hey, hit the ding ding little bell there. Listen, the conclusion of today, I always start with the conclusion, right? The truth is be ready. Now, let me give you the reasons why I think it means to be ready and what it means to be ready and why we should be ready. The conclusion or truth is to be ready. Now, let me give you the reasons and following uh, follow up. Be ready is a singular truth for today. It's my truth for today. Matthew twenty four tells us, but concerning the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It's Matthew 24, 36 to 39. A few verses later, Matthew says, It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Verse 46, the NIV puts it this way, If the master returns and Find that the finds that the servant has done or is doing so a good job, there will be a reward. Be found doing is the truth for today. Doing what, you might ask? Being prepared and being found living the Christian life when Jesus returns. Nothing less. Not in apathy, not in too much relaxation. The reason in conclusion is yes. Okay, but some Christians will go through the tribulation. And I mean yes. I mean, some are going to go through, some are not. Now, what does that mean? How is that going to play out? Does that sound like a conflict and a breach of law of the non-contradiction? The answer is no, and today I will explain the reason I hold to that view. For those who might not be familiar with end times, which is called eschatology, I'd like to share from an article uh, called What is the Rapture and When Will It Happen? published by Biola U- University, Professor Alan 
Holberg on uh, what the Bible says about the end times. So what is the rapture? What is the scriptural evidence for it? This, the rapture is the doctrine, the biblical doctrine of the return of Christ. All believers will be caught up, that's brought up, captured, or raptured rather, to meet the Lord in the air. Doesn't mean he's coming back. He's just going to be meet us in the air and pull us up. The bodies of the dead believers will be resurrected as well, and all believers living and dead will be glorified. And it is taught explicitly in one uh, first Thess- uh, in First Thessalonians four fifteen to seventeen, and more or less implicitly in First Corinthians fifteen to fifty one to fifty five and John fourteen two. Other passages such as Matthew 24, 31, 2, Thessalonians 1, 10, and Revelation, right? Everybody knows that. 14, 14 to 16 verses are the kind of debated uh, going through there as to pre-rapture, which we're going to talk about. But what purpose does the rapture serve in the overall purpose of God in creation? Now, how does it fit into God's redemptive plan to restore what was lost in Adam? to restore the proper functioning of the rule and creation, the resurrection of believers is part of the restoration, as Paul teaches in Romans 8, 18 to 23. So in its, insofar as the rapture and the resurrection are associated, the rapture plays a role in that restoration. However, the scriptures also teach that before the establishment of the uh, mess- messianic kingdom and the return of Christ, God will pour his wrath out upon the world opposed to, to his rule. Now, the church sounds pretty scary. <laughs> it sounds like a little bit of the news right now. The church is promised reprieve from the wrath, and the rapture is the means by which it is protected. This begs the question as to when does all this happen? Does Jesus return to collect Christ followers first? Before, during, or after the tribulation period? That's the question for today. Today will be addressed two main points I'd like to look at. First, does the Bible predict a pre-rapture, pre-tribulation moment when Jesus will call those up and having placed their full trust in the Lord Jesus Christ up into the clouds before the time of tribulation? Does Jesus call followers up into the clouds and into heaven mid-tribulation, meaning half the way through the tribulation? Or does Jesus not call Christ followers up into the clouds up into heaven until after the tribulation, ouch, or at the end thereof? This is called post-tribulation. That is the first point. Okay, the second point we want to look at comes in the form of a question, which is, how do some believers in Jesus Christ then get raptured at the end of the tribulation period? See, if they've been already taken up, the first question we were looking at. Simple answer is a question to the question is that God sends 144,000 Jewish prophets into the world, 12 from each tribe, specifically to share the gospel truth of Jesus Christ. And out of that group, many will stand, then come to Christ. But because the rapture of the church, which are authentic believers in Jesus Christ, will have already have occurred, this is what's going to happen is it's, you get to say, how that? Well, they're going to come to Christ during the tribulation. Those who come to Christ during the tribulation, a time of tribulation, will have to persevere through the second half of the of the tribulation, I guess the whole tribulation of seven years, which lasts three and a half years for each half, first half, second half. We're not going to get into what that all looks like today. We want to keep on point. And so it's the second half of the tribulation, those second 3.5 years, uh, the start of the tribulation period that one that the one world government leader breaks the treaty halfway with Israel and great persecution of the Jews and new converts in Jesus Christ breaks out. Uh, mainly, you're talking about the Jews here is the focus of the scriptures. In a paper titled, Why a Pre-Tribulational Rapture, Richard uh, Mayhew, Senior Vice President and Dean Professor and Pastoral Ministries and uh, Theology uh, Emeritus at the Master Seminary in Ohio State University, makes the point that every rapture position has their own zealous defenders. I'm going to be fair, who who have employed really, in some cases, unacceptable reasoning or flawed methodology to prove their point. Some of the less than satisfactory approaches that we have observed in the rapture debate include, number one, putting non-biblical historical documents on equal par with scripture to gain a greater sense of authority for one one's conclusion or, or even to refute a biblical perspective or position. Second, reading current events into the scripture to prove one's point, uh, I think it could be helpful, could also be wrong. That's why we have to not panic here. Third, 
inserting one's uh, predetermined position without first proving it into scriptural passage to gain apparent biblical support. That's another problem. We have to be careful we don't come to the conclusion before we give the facts. And fourth, attacking the character of one who holds a particular view that might be different than ours uh, to discredit their view is a fallacy, the scarecrow fallacy, and it's wrong. But fifth and lastly, Dr. Richard uh, Mayhew, again, cautions against accusing advocates of an opposing view of holding certain views unacceptable. Now let's step back and look at the entire concept first of the rapture. So what does rapture mean? The English noun or verb rapture comes from the Latin noun rapture or verb uh, rapio, which refers to the Greek word uh, harpa and then big C, which is used 14 times in the New Testament. The basic idea of the word is to remove suddenly or to snatch away. It's used in the New Testament uh, in reference to uh, stealing or plundering, Matthew 11, uh, 12, or 12, and 12, 29, 13, 19, and removing, uh, just to be removed. You can see that removing, it's used in that form, John 6, 15, and Acts um, 8, thir- uh, 39. There's also another use which focuses on being caught up in the heaven, and it's used in Paul's third heaven experience. You can read about that in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, and 4, uh, and Christ's uh, ascension to heaven in Revelation 12, 5. Now, obviously, harpas, harpas is the perfect word to describe uh, God suddenly taking up the church from earth to heaven as in the first part of the Christ's second coming. However, the term itself contains no hint of the rapture time in relationship to Daniel's 17th week. First Thessalonians, however, for uh, 13 to 18 verses teaches that Christ will return in the air to resurrect Christians that have, that have died and then as well the living and the dead and will rapture the Latin for caught up, living believers together with the dead, so all will uh, will from then on be with the Lord. And then tribulation starts, and the support for tri- pre-tribulation, which is the position that Christ will return and retrieve and take up into uh, all his authentic <clears throat> authentic Christ followers before the tribulation period. Now, let me read verses sixteen to eighteen. It says this: For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven. In a cry, with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and the sound from trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then who are alive. Who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. It's encouraging for me, I'll tell you what. Now, to answer the question, will authentic believers in Jesus Christ go through the tribulation period? (laughs) Let me uh, state an important disclaimer first. Cultural Christians will go through the tribulation period uh, and go through the Armageddon. And authentic Christians will not. Self-proclaimed cultural Christians who feel that they are good people or a God wouldn't do mean things to them and send them to hell or they're Christian just in name. Uh, that's not going to cut it. God first and in, you know, God's, listen, God, his first deal with us is in being relationship with him. True relationship to go through the tribulation and to have the opportunity, if still alive, to accept the Lord will occur in those seven years, but you're going to have to suffer through the full seven years. They will have to go through all seven years of the tribulation. Those who are authentic Christians, meaning Christ followers, who are fully sold out for the and trust their life in Jesus Christ before tribulation, will get taken up or raptured into the sky. This is before tribulation period of seven years even starts. That, again, is called pre-tribulation, or the pre-rapture position. Now, there are numerous views of the rapture, but the main views are as follows. you got the um, pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation. Those are the three basics. There's some others, but these are the main ones. Post-tribulationists believe that the rapture of Christians and the second coming of Jesus Christ occur after the tribulation very end, right after that happens. Mid-tribulationists hold that the rapture will occur in the middle of tribulation, the three and a half years, so they go through the first half but not the second half. That's mid-tribulationism. 
pre-tribulationists believe that Christ will return in the rapture prior to the tribulation to take believers to heaven. They understand the second coming of Christ's judgment to be after the tribulation. Other less popular views hold things like the rapture will occur before the tribulation, but only spiritually mature Christians will go partially uh, rapture theory, and the rapture will also occur during the, uh, the last half of the tribulation, but before the final judgment, pre-wrath rapture view. I don't hold to any of that. I'm not certain there's much to be held uh, scripturally on that. There, there are numerous arguments for a, though, for a pre-tribulational view of rapture. So I want to note that first, that no tribulational passage mentions the church. That's important. Revelation 4 describes the great tribulation, including no reference to the church. Phrases such as those in Christ, the body of Christ, or the church are not found. Tribulation believers are called saints or the elect, general terms that can apply to believers in any age. Actually, no Old or New Testament passage in the tribulation mentions the church, Deuteronomy 4.20, Jeremiah 34 to 11 verses, Daniel 9, 27, and 12 verses 1, uh, Matthew 24 verses 15 to 31, and then 1 Thessalonians 9, 10, and 5, 4 to 9. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Well, I think that the reason why you're hearing that is exactly what I said. Just because you go to church every day doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're going to be raptured. It doesn't mean you're going to heaven. It's authentic believers in Jesus Christ, as my pastor John Monroe says at Calvary Church. So those that are truly in Christ, not religious people, people who have a true, authentic, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In support of pre-tribulation, several passages explicitly state that Christians won't go through the tribulation. Revelation 3.10 teaches clearly that believers will be kept from the hour of testing. Revelation uh, 4.18 the Great Tribulation, uh, post-tribulationists must either really change the meaning of these words or push all of the catastrophes of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation uh, or suggest that believers somehow are protected from the tribulation, outside of what Scripture tells us, from tribulation judgment on the earth. None of these explain really the facts. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 similarly states that Christians are to wait for his Son from heaven, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Thessalonians 5, 9 to 10 teaches the same truth. The imminence of Christ's return demands a, a pre-trib rapture view. According to the pre-tribulational view, Christ could return at any time. It's imminence, right? Many passages suggest this. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, Philippians 3, 20, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1 10 and 1 Timothy 6 14, amongst others. According to other rapture views, there is no imminence. Christ's return for believers would be a predictable moment, middle of the tribulation, and right? Then we'd know. That's not something we would we just time it right to the moment. The logical conclusion is that nobody will be left to live in the millennium in the post uh, post trib views. When the tribulation ends, there must be some people left in their natural bodies to live out and to populate the millennial earth. Isaiah 65, 7, and uh, the 25 uh, verses speak to that. It is as if post-tribs believers, uh, the rapture of believers and the second coming of Christ and judgment are both at the end of the tribulation. There's no one left to populate the millennial earth under that view. All believers are in heaven raptured up or resurrected. All unbelievers are destroyed and in hell. But in the pre-trib view, there's no problem. Many people will be saved during the tribulation. Revelation 7, 4, 9, and 14. Of those, many will be bartered. Revelation 6, 11, and 7, 14, 13, 15. But some will survive always to the end of the tribulation. That's got to be the toughest. Matthew 24, 22, and Mark 13, 13. These will enter the millennium in natural bodies. Matthew 25, 34, and Luke 17, 34 to 37. See, this answers one of two initial points, that believers will be pre-raptured and clarifies that some will yet become Christ followers during the tribulation period, and hence those believers will have to endure until the end, and some will even be martyred. But others will 
you know, listen, they're going to make it all the way to the end. God bless them. After the battle of Armageddon and tribulation period of seven years. Remember, the truth comes first. The reasons come second. Remember my singular truth. Place your trust in Jesus Christ today. Now, if you have not truly done so already, and for us who are believers in Jesus Christ, well, we should be ready mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We are to be doing the work, the mission the Lord has given each one of us, despite however large or small that mission might be. Now, I want to clarify that the rapture and the second coming of Christ are separate events. The events of the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ in judgment are distinctly different, making it impossible to combine them into one event. Furthermore, the Bible's clear that seven years of tribulation means just that, seven literal years, not figurative years of tribulation. Furthermore, the Bible's clear that God takes us before this horrible seven years of tribulation. So why would God do that? And that's a question I've asked myself. I believe that the world will increasingly be, will become increasingly hostile towards Christians, as we're seeing now, leading up to the tribulation period. And those seven short years of persecution, but very intense, it's going to be forced worship of the beasts, will be the pinnacle of spiritual battle, which started with Satan and a third of his angels who fell to the earth when Adam and then Adam and Eve sinned, and then Jesus came and proclaimed the truth, and he was hung on the cross for it. And he gave us another, another 2,000 years to get it right, and the God in, the, in truth and in an authentic way, not a religious way. Listen, Jesus comes back. He takes up those who are fully, not partially, committed to Jesus Christ. The tribulation will be an intense period where unbelievers will be left to choose between two vivid depictions, good and evil. And in the most intense form, then God will send 144,000 Messianic Jewish evangelists into the world, 12,000 from each tribe, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Ishakar, Zubulam, Joseph, and finally, Benjamin, young Benjamin. Revelation 7, verses 1 to 8. This happens as the end of the world unfolds. Just before unleashing his wrath, God deploys 144,000 evangelists to share, those are Jewish evangelists, Messianic Jewish, to share the gospel with those who are left on the earth. Those who are truly authentic during the uh, tribulation period. See, John was shown four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, referring to the four directions of the compass. And they are commanded by another angel to suspend their judgments during the tribulation temporarily until the servants of God, and those are the, the, uh, the 144,000, and basically will be accomplished. Now, Revelation 7, 1 to 3, you can read about that. When the servants of God will be sealed before the sealed judgments commence, you can read about that in Revelation 14, 1, indicates that the seal will be the name of the Lamb and the Father written in their, on their foreheads. Don't confuse that with 666. This is the seal that God gives you, but God's seal is different. You'll have, we'll talk about, uh, kind of, if you have missed that, you can go back to last week's episode on 666 and the Mark of the Beast. We, we address that. So the purpose of the seal of God's seal is service and protection. See, they are sealed from, the, from protection, from harm, to provide protection so that they cannot be hurt either by the judgments poured out by God or by the persecutions on earth against believers. See, they are also sealed for service so that they are the ones who will proclaim the messianic good news of the gospel in the tribulation or during the tribulation period. And the identity of these servants is very clear. 144,000 Jews to be sealed as servants of God at the beginning of the tribulation. At the beginning of the tribulation, they will be sealed for protection and for the, their service. Now, the 144,000 sealed servants are clearly Jews, what we would call Messianic Jews again. They are not the church. They are not the chosen few or the cult the, that the Jehovah Witnesses, that's a cult, it teaches. They are 144,000 post-rapture Messianic Jewish evangelists to who God is going to accomplish one of his main purposes of tribulation, which is the salvation of the myriad of, of tribulation saints. And these sealed servants of God are Jews and are made clear in verses 4 to 8. Now, what happens when Christ comes in the air to retrieve authentic followers in Jesus Christ? First Thessalonians 
13 to 18 teaches that Christ will return in the air to resurrect Christians who have died and then rapture. It's Latin, again, for caught up. Living believers together and the dead together, they will then be one with the Lord, not one with the Lord, but in presence of the Lord as one. Um, Let me read verses 16 to 18. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. And this is my encouragement to y'all today, you know. At the end of the day, that's my the reason. This is the main reason that comes first, as is stated up front. See, stated reason that I want to leave you with today is don't panic. Instead, pray. Do not get overtaken by anxiety, but act on your mission God has given you. Okay? Be found working. He returns. The focus of the upcoming episode, by the way, is going to be what are we doing in terms of waiting for the Lord. Lastly, don't tire, but trust in the Lord for your provision, your protection and peace that surpasses all understanding. So while the world depletes of God's goodness, those and only those who have placed their full trust in Jesus Christ have access to the Holy Spirit to help them through this time and to give this peace that surpasses all understanding. Philippians 4 tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always again, and I will say, rejoice, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand, and do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 4 4-7 verses. One of the most incredible pieces of scripture for encouraging us during this time, huh? At all times. I want to leave you here at the end with a message of hope from Billy Graham, published May 22, 2020. The Billy Graham gave this, believe it or not, in 1969. It's called The Signs, The End of the World. It's Biblical Wisdom from Billy Graham and Franklin Graham by BGEA. Billy Graham said people tend to react to the idea of the end of the world in one of three ways, which is pessimism, activism, or hope. That's Billy quoted. He says this, I belong to the group that has a theology of hope, he said, because my hope is not centered in the world or in what man's going to do or not going to do. My hope is centered in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, who the Bible says is going to come back someday and strengthen the whole mess out. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you also have hope, especially when it comes to, you have something to hope for, especially when it comes to the end times. The world doesn't. Those without Christ do not. The idea of the end of the world may seem frightening, for those of us who are in Christ have nothing to fear. And that is the hope and your reason for truth for today. I hope it's been helpful for you. I hope it's uh, been informative, encouraging. And listen, it should be for all believers in Jesus Christ as our hope is not in the world, but in Jesus Christ, as Billy Graham said, Jesus Christ is our hope. Next week, we'll be talking more deeply, Del Potter and I will be, about the meaning of tribulation, period. And you don't want to miss that. Make sure that you tune in with Del and I. And we're also going to break down the biblical views. I'll be doing that on the uh, from, from an ethical perspective, is what is the biblical view on anarchy? That's going to be coming up as well. We see that a lot with Antifa and the violence. And just want to break that down, give you a biblical view of anarchy. Listen, we've seen with Antifa, with violence and murder. We've seen, again, peaceful protests, and looting going on in our country. We're going to make some sense of all that, which is right and which is wrong. Because if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below, and I will get back to you, I promise, within a reasonable amount of time and put them on air as well those questions and until next time please like subscribe and share and if you're watching us on youtube hit that bell ding ding and i'll see you guys the next reason for truth episode i'm your host Stephen garofalo and this is your reason for truth for today